Hi, this is Lilia with the Help Yourself podcast. And with me today, I have Natasha Fullerton, the She Coach and Shambhala Yoga Instructor. Natasha, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How are you? Thank you for inviting me, Lilia. Yes, I'm doing well. Yeah, for a Monday. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, Mondays are always a struggle, no matter what. Um, so listen, uh, your story is quite fascinating. You we, you did us the huge honour of hosting the uh, a month in the Heal Scotland Wellbeing Hub, and you know I found out a lot about your story there. And I think what we're finding now is that when we cannot get solutions from the allopathic system, i.e., surgery or drugs, that we're forced into researching and finding out what we can do for ourselves. And that's really what happened with you, wasn't it? And you then, yes, uh -huh. and because you managed to learn so much about your own body, you now can take that knowledge forward and help other women um, from that place of absolute knowing and experience, which I think is so, so powerful. So let, can you just give us a little overview of how, you know, what happened with your health picture and how you ended up becoming the She Coach? <laughs> Okay, so um, she just to let you know that stands for self. It was health, but I've changed it to holistic and empowered living, and I think that's sort of been my journey over the last five years. Um, I went travelling at the end of two thousand and sixteen. Um, it was just a a lifelong thing I'd always wanted to do. I was thirty five, thirty six, and I went off to hell if I'm going to go, and it was around about that time that my periods went irregular. So um, the first month away, I didn't get a period. And obviously, I maybe thought I was pregnant, took a pregnancy test, nothing came back. So I just went with it. But actually, at that time as well, I had started I started traveling, went to um, Africa, first of all, and then made my way to Nepal. And that's where me and my partner decided to go to a yoga retreat. And that just totally changed everything for me. Um, the retreat, I managed to also do a yoga yogic cleanse which was a colon cleanse but just from drinking salt water and doing certain yogic um, movements and I was just like afterwards how I felt it was amazing so I sort of stayed on that path and I was also dipping into different yoga philosophies they spent time in an ashram and just really got a sense of myself again because I recognized that I had been so disconnected to my body for for probably all my life until I'd started on this path of yoga and as cliche as it sounds it did start to change my life as I started to um, find out more about the Ayurvedic system which is the sister science of yoga if you like and just how um, how easy it is to live holistically but how much we're disconnected from that in the west so that was really interesting and at the same time as my periods were irregular I started to work with an Ayurvedic doctor again gave me that insight into just my body sort of giving me all the signals that something was wrong so I was traveling for around about six months came home and went to see the doctor and the doctor said to me that it was more than like most likely that because I was traveling my body was sort of upset the sort of circadian rhythm and intelligent as our bodies are that maybe that just knew I wasn't ready to be have a child so my period stopped so I sort of took that on board but they said just keep in touch and if it does if they don't come back then obviously we can do more tests so because I'd sort of been on this journey I'd been getting Reiki sessions and in a Reiki session the woman had said I don't know what it is but I just get this sense of something around about the left side down at your ovaries I would advise you to get it checked out if you can I can't say what it is so I went back to the doctors and I just said because previously I'd had ovarian cysts and this is where the dots all started to connect, like things that had been going wrong for me prior to this happening. And so I went and they said I did have a cyst, but they were cysts that were quite common and they happen with um, your menstrual cycle. They come and then they go, but to keep an eye on it, come back in six months. So I was going back out traveling again because we only came back with uh, family issues. So we went back out again and periods didn't come back. And it was something that was obviously conscious in my mind, but at the same time, I was grateful because I was learning more about this holistic living and the traditional Chinese medicine systems. 
Ayurveda and also just different energy healing systems. So I very much made the decision, conscious decision to stop eating meat um, and to stop taking pharmaceutical medicines and just start to really look into how I could heal myself. So I came back with that knowledge. Still kind of made the connection with the GP again, but they just said to me, sorry, they um, um, transferred me. I got an appointment with a gynecologist and they said, well, if your if your periods aren't back, then we'd advise you to go back on the pill, which I'd came off around about 31, 32, and I didn't want to go back on. So I left it and I says, no, I don't want to go back on the pill. So they just said, there's nothing else that we can do for you at this point. So that was, I think it was about 35, 36. So this was me going on 38 at this point. And I was just like, no, I can't keep going on like this. So I was doing all the sort of, holistic healing stuff but my period still didn't come back so I went back to the doctors and it was just by off chance they referred me to a, a locum um, gynecologist and they had then said to me to um oh, they'd done the scan and everything said everything was fine and my ovaries was fine but they were going to um, refer me to assisted conception so the assisted conception clinic which I had no idea why I was getting referred there because I wasn't thinking about having children at that point even though I was a bit later in life and it was something I was maybe going to start to look at so it was sort of all just kind of boom 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 I was just going along with it and then I went and then they were like we would recommend that you, you do IVF at this point because um you aren't ovulating as you should but we don't think it's a um, anything menopausal or anything like that so I went with it, spoke to my partner. He was a bit like, okay, um, we were with each other for six years, however. So we went with it and then lockdown happened and then I wasn't able to get any more appointments after the tests had been done. Um, before lockdown, they were still saying there was no sign of it being um, anything to do with the menopause. But then um, six months into the lockdown, I still hadn't any periods. I went back to the doctors. They did tests and said no. Actually, it's shown signs of a premature menopause, which is different from a early menopause because early menopause generally happens for women before the age of 40. But because I was under 40, they said it's premature and it's known as premature ovarian insufficiency. Another name for it is premature ovarian failure, which they're trying to move away from because it does have that connotation of you're a failure basically as well. So insufficiency isn't much better. Um, so that was the diagnosis I was given with given um, and because there's not a lot of awareness around about it it still meant I wasn't getting the support that I needed to sort of make decisions around what was next for me I was told IVF wasn't a possibility donor eggs would be the only option if I did want to conceive and that was basically how it was left and um, I was signed off the assisted conception clinic because I wasn't wanting to go down that route at the moment Gynecology, I was told, was going to be a, a year waiting list. So the only other option was private. So that's how my journey began with looking into what had been going wrong for me. And I could see the signs from a very young age. Like I had been diagnosed with um, Raynaud's at a young age. So circulation had started to give me trouble. That then led on to a diagnosis of lupus, an autoimmune condition. And then I started to see that I was getting problems with my reproductive health. I was getting ongoing cysts. So, yeah, I just started to see my body had been giving me all these signs for a long time. I was on, on antibiotics for a long period of time for my skin. So I seen how that had probably impacted on things. Um, I'd experienced trauma as a child and just started, yeah, to connect all these dots and just seeing the lack of awareness that we have in our when we go to doctors, we're just not told that these can all impact one another. Can't say for certain what caused what, but it's like just, yeah, I want to now, I've done my own research and working on myself, just bring that awareness to other women, like just to know that don't just go to the doctor, get told this, and then that's your only option. And a lot of the time, unfortunately, it is us having to do the work ourselves. Um, but just want to support women anyone in general really so that they don't need to go out and have to get that degree and what to do um, when something goes wrong with your body. Mm -hmm. Yes because that's the thing isn't it when you're trying things out on yourself it takes time and there's a lot of conflicting information if your energy levels aren't great you know it's um, it can be very confusing and to, to the extent where people just give up because they they don't really understand and 
I think certainly from the work I do, there's never really one reason. There might be one thing that broke the camel's back. I think the straw that breaks the camel's back is the most true saying. And, you know, certainly when I'm working on letting go, it's about taking the straws off the camel's back. And a lot of that can be emotional trauma based, but it can also be fungus, parasite, virus based. It can also be hormonal based, you know, and I was talking to um, somebody at the weekend about this, you know, it doesn't really matter what system you approach it from. All you really need to do is give the body enough support back so that it will heal itself, because obviously the body knows what to do. So um, it's uh, the intelligence is all there. And I think that's the thing we're just doing by these things that you've talked about, understanding why the body's talking louder and louder. And mm. um, yeah, and understanding that when we can correct the, the internal environment and the external environment and we're patient, um, you know, that very often it can, you know, it will rebalance or can we live with it, which I think is another option that we never really we talk we never really talk about you know it's um just living with the body that, with whatever it happens to be doing so i think the thing as a woman and as a mum and a gran you know there's there's the kind of physical side of you know of many periods and think well what's actually going on but then again it's the whole thing around being able to have a child um or not which can be massive you know in terms of emotional and even if you're not if you're not ready the, the idea that that choice could be taken away from you. And I think lockdown as well, there was a lot of women when the IVF got caught in that time, you know, where they weren't vaccinated, they weren't allowed to have the, to go through with the procedures. And then of course things were put in hold because of all the restrictions, et cetera, which really puts a, another straw on the camel's back. So how did that, you know, what was the, the most difficult thing for you around that? Well, there was a few things. Um, I'm quite open about this now. Is I actually did have two terminations when I was younger, just been in um, relationships where I just didn't feel comfortable in having a child, a child at that point. So there was that that came up for me. Um, and yeah, just that sort of urgency then to think, oh, I want to have a child now, but not actually thinking, do I want this child right now? And having that forced upon me. So there was a lot around that point of like panic because I know I was coming up to 40 and that was going against me as well emotionally I did go to a very low place because it can be very isolating Um, I think just when people don't really understand as well there's a lot of flipping comments like being with friends and they'll be saying oh you, you're glad you don't have kids look at the way these ones are or I can give you a loan of these for a weekend and just yeah just a bit of insensitive insensitivity there um, and then with my partner as well just that feeling like because he was not much younger than me I think it's five years but thinking will he go away with someone else then if I'm not able to give him that child um, and then it brought up a lot of things that have happened in my past and not feeling good enough and not worthy enough not deserving um, but I realised at that point I could let that define me or I could then again I have got that resilience anyway, but just look to see, right, what can I do here? Um, and one of those was going private to see, because I've been told that the NHS have got a threshold anyway, and if you don't meet that, then they don't want to have, like, the failures with the IVF. Mm -hmm. So I went private, but, again, that wasn't a great experience for me. The woman actually said to me, I mean, I don't understand why you went pre private. What did you expect? Um, there was just no empathy there for me being another, another woman to another woman and I told her why I'd went. I was working with a herbalist at the time who had said that she'd heard different stories with the NHS success and private could be an option because at the end of the day they're a business as well and if they think they've got an opportunity to support you then they will. Yes. So there was a lot of um, insensitivity there and she basically says it's only donor eggs is your option here so um, that's entirely up to you and so there was no like aftercare or anything like that so yeah it was quite isolating the only place I did get some um, enlightenment if you like is there's a, a organization called the Daisy Network that works specifically with the condition that I have and on there you could just see like everyone was just in this place where they just didn't know what to do HRT had been recommended to me as well but I didn't think because I was of that mindset, HRC is something that you take when you're 50, and mm -hmm. um, didn't realise that it could be an option to support you to ovulate. 
Um, and because I was very much against pharmaceutical medicines, I was like, I'm not going down that route. But then in hindsight, maybe if I'd have done that a bit earlier, I could have used that as an option to support me um, to ovulate. So there was just lots of like, yeah, feeling lost emotionally, then so much information out there, not knowing what was relevant to me because I was still told it's not a menopause that you're going through. It's not, you're not in perimenopause. You've just got symptoms of it, but you could still ovulate and have a child. So yeah, it was very, yeah, just overwhelming. And at points it can still get overwhelming. I see myself go back there when I'm like, oh, I want to have a child and maybe I should go down the donor egg route now. And it wasn't until maybe a Two months ago, I sat and I went to a low place again and I was thinking, is that my purpose? Maybe it's not to have children and maybe it's having that acceptance round about it instead. Because I'm very much as like, a lot of the time I think we force nature and it's exactly what you were saying there about maybe you you deal with what's happening with your health rather than trying to fix everything. So I thought to myself, well, maybe for me, I was in Ghana at the time and I seen how many children don't have a life, they're on the streets, that sort of thing. And I was like, well, maybe my purpose is helping another child to have a life that they wouldn't have. So I'm sort of sitting with that now. I don't still don't know what my options will be, but I'm just, at one point I was trying to force that and no, I need to have a child now. I've been told I can't. And a lot of that came from me and having to be in control of my life a lot of the time. And that was to, totally to, taken away. And it's like what you say about that process of being able to let go. And that's been a big thing for me is watching myself when I start to try and grip and control. And that's even been with the the use of supplements and trying to look after my health. I think you can transfer one element of control that's taken away and then you try to control another aspect of your life. So I've just had to really keep coming back to that letting go process and saying, no, what will be, will be. And people can think it's spiritually bypassing, but for me, it's not. I recognise what is and I recognise, mm. yeah, need to let this go because it's not helping my health. It's an added stress and that's what I'm trying to release as well as the stress with everything. Absolutely. And I think what you've just said there is, you know, when it comes to coaching, um, that's really what it's, it's laying out everything these are my options or potential options. And I think when it comes to trying to have the baby yourself, there's never any guarantees. Let's face it, I never had that problem. I had three kids at the time I was 20. <laughs> opposite problem. But I feel mm. very strongly for women, you know, now, because just the crazy way that we all live and then that desire for a family, which you just always assume at some point might happen. Um, or certainly that you would have the choice to make it happen and then what happens when that and how do you actually deal with it when you you know when it comes to that time and when do you give up you know my friend found out on her 45th birthday that she was pregnant <laughs> she you know wanted a baby all her life and that's when when he or at he decided to come in you know so it's but it's the letting go that is almost that you we know that with people that adopt you know very, very often nine months later I mean, it's a thing. The mind is so powerful. And when we release all need for all these things, and I think possibly a baby, I would imagine, or maybe a soulmate is one of those, you know, these really powerful, strong urges that if we feel we don't fulfill it, can we can can cause us a lot of suffering without realizing that we're actually we can shift our perception and let go. And you know, you're clearly well educated and you can help people, co you coach people to say, well. Let's take all this kind of grey noise here and look at really what is what can be done. What because again we like the labels, don't we? And the diagnosis, which can be very unhelpful at times. But it also means we we kind of know if we know what's wrong, then we can maybe have a chance of knowing what to do. But within that, the body will do <laughs> whatever the hell it mm -hmm. wants. Sometimes you know it'll surprise us. So, you know, I think that that's where coaching for so many women um, is absolutely essential because eventually if you have to decide, right, well, maybe I'll adopt, for example, you know, because there's 15,000 Scottish children in homes right now. And is that your way or is it to go back out to Ghana and help the children there? And, and again, it's just all the conscious options that you can have laid out in front of you and I think what what I'm hearing right now as a coach <laughs> mm -hmm. is that it's not crystal clear yet but it will be because you're sitting with it and you understand that right okay you're looking out and looking at understanding there's so many different paths you can take to fulfill whatever it is you want to fulfill and then it'll be very clear 
when because you'll feel it in your body, won't you? Um, what the right the way ahead is for you, and you'll be at peace with that. And I think that's the other thing as well. I think the changing roles, which has become very evident now, where we don't even know what if I'm, you're allowed to call a man a man or a woman a woman, <laughs> and the woke craziness that is out there and all the different things. You know, it's no wonder people are actually getting their brains are getting fried. So I think you know, for you, the coaching thing is so so important to help you just get around and go right. Okay, here are my options. And also, I think understanding why perhaps, I mean, you just identified there, and the same thing happened for me. I ended up with chronic fatigue, which started off from the dentist filling my mouth with mercury, abscesses, antibiotics, sinus infections, more antibiotics, chronic fatigue, you know, constant headaches, more antihistamines, which inadvertently, unbeknown to me, were destroying my gut bacteria and causing a dysbiosis there. And that's very often the case. And, you know, like you, you wander around aimlessly, you know, a bit foggy, a bit fatigued, et cetera. Um, not, not having a clue, you know, not, who do you turn to? So thank you for being of service <laughs> to the women. And, you know, that phenomenal information that you gave out in that, um, that month, which was for, for uh, August, September. September and the, these lives and these videos are still available in our wellbeing hub if people want to catch up with all of that fantastic information. So now talk to us a little bit about yoga because you've got a yoga business too. Is that no, that's kind of ceased because we moved abroad to Ghana. Um we've still got it there. It's a social enterprise. I did set it up um when I came back from traveling in 2018. So um just because things changed after lockdown. And we had an in-person studio and then we moved it to online and then for me I just sort of transitioned from yoga really helped me with my healing journey but because like we spoke about there's different aspects of healing and I recognised yoga was my route in that's helped me transition into coaching and um, so that's what my main focus is at the moment is um, implementing yoga. I've done certain courses to kind of support um, the more therapeutic sides of yoga so yoga for addiction yoga for women's health and other ones as well yoga for trauma so for me as I know it's been really um, influential in me coming back into my body so it's something that I use within my coaching not everyone is open to yoga but it's just allowing people to see that this yoga isn't just the physical practice that you do it incorporates meditation it incorporates breath work and these are all really important to our nervous system to help regulate it and bring it back into balance so I use that alongside different modalities that I've found have really worked for me which includes working with the moon because I think that really helped me to even though I wasn't having a regular cycle I was able to pick up on my emotional health and what was going for me and recognizing how that you know synced with the moon and that was something that I only found out about from traveling as well and um, attended women's circles particularly moon circles so I incorporate that I've actually trained recently in a modality called belief coding which incorporates elements of NLP, EFT and um, other energy healing systems to really get into our subconscious and look at the limiting beliefs that we have and how unless we change the limiting beliefs it's really hard to change our mindset and we'll go back to the same pattern so that's something that I also incorporate in my coaching now so I'm just building this toolbox of different things reiki nutrition and it really just depends on the person and where they're at especially as what you said it's like looking at what's the main thing for you right now what's what is it that needs to be kind of worked on and I do think a lot of the time nutrition is a, a good way to start because in all the yoga training that I did in traditional Chinese medicine it's the first thing to look at is like what's your diet like so um, it is a big part of my journey as well and just being able to support my fertility and um, so just incorporate all that now and just work with women using that modality which I've called the she model because it's looking at ourselves that's a big thing that I believe that we can be out there doing for everybody else and we're not very good at receiving and looking at our own sense of self so that's a big part of it and then holistically just living a way that's not just physically but looking at every aspect of our life and hopefully that then empowers us to make the changes that we need to and 
I think a big thing is that when we go on this journey as well, it can be quite lonely because people start to go like, oh, you're eating this funny way or you're going to these <laughs> woo-woo circles and all this different things. So it's about really feeling empowered in that sense of self to be like, yeah, that's the way I live my life right now. And if you don't like it, then that's your issue, not mine. And what I've started to recognise is that you gravitate towards a different circle of people, if you like, and yeah, um, it feels more empowering as well, being with like-minded people. So, yeah, just trying to support women to see that that is possible for them. Yes, I think there's never been a more important time, certainly in my lifetime, to tribe up, you know, to support each other. And, like, I know that you, you know, you'd sit, put a post up the other day about how you'd been feeling, and I just was like, that's exactly how I've been feeling. You know, what was my life all about? What have I even done? And it's like, what is that about, you know? It's interesting to see that that can still come in. Um, you know, even at the ripe old age of 63. But what you were saying there, what came to my mind was, you know, my granddaughter's 10. And, you know, when I was in Malta, because of there's no clouds, you're very clearly the moon you saw every single night. So you really understood the cycles. It was very, very clear because obviously where I live in Argyll, you're lucky if you ever see even the full moon. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought it'd be beautiful to teach her. She's actually excited about, you know, her period coming. And um, instead of making it a neg negative thing, that would be a nice thing to do, is to get these young girls and explain about the cycles. You know, I mean, I was in the menopause, way in the menopause before I started to really understand the cycles and, you know, when's a good time in the month to do certain things and, you know, and how the cycle works and the power of it, the creation power in there, not just to actually make another human, but how to harness that creative power and, and use it in your life. So that would be a great if you could come up with something and we could inspire young, these really young, you know, like girls that are just about to go into high school to help us see that, you know, a different way. You know, my son said to me the other day, he said, how did we ever get to think that a woman that has children and stays home with them was a negative thing? You know, why have we made all the things that we happen quite organically for women, periods, you know, the mood swings, the hormonal swings, etc. you know, staying at home with your children, all of that has actually almost been, you know, looked down upon almost, like you don't have a career, but the most important thing you could ever do. And I believe it doesn't have to, you know, like you, I've done a lot of travelling, I've got adopted grandchildren all over the world I you know you don't they don't need to be yours <laughs> mm -hmm. you know to have the joy that um that you can get I have got my own biological grandkids but I get a lot of joy from my friends kids as well you know so and I think if you go back to a tribe where you know sometimes they don't really even know who their parent is but there's so many female and male on average 33 caregivers that that security is there of all these people around you that care and will give you, and you can gravitate towards whoever you want for your mentoring. But as the way we live in the West is, you know, it's very sort of um, separate in our house. You know, you've got women like actually with a newborn baby on their own in a house. You know, that's just not mm -hmm. a healthy situation. You know, and I know that you're, are you half Ghanaian? Is that your... Yes, half Ghanaian, half Scottish. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, and you've lived out there. So, you know, you must see, I, my friends were in Uganda, so that's where I was, where I was like, oh my God, you know, I loved watching the, the you know, how it's done there and going into the markets, there's thousands of women and mm -hmm. babies, and none of them are crying because they're strapped on, I don't know if it's the same in Ghana, um, they're strapped on, tied onto your back with a sheet. And you know, if you're if you're tall enough to hold have a baby tied on you, <laughs> that's how it works. So that human contact is there's no plastic, there's no prams, there's no, you know, where I was in Kisoro, there there was you know, there's none of that. So it was still very much the way I suppose we had to do it as well before all these plastic things were invented to put the child into, which I'm not you know, I think I, there's great um, you know, benefits to that, but it's just looking at both ways of doing it and going, can we take some of this and some of this and create something that's even more powerful, but that serves women and children? Because let's face it, if a child, if the mum's stressed and unhappy, the child picks up on that, you know? Mm -hmm. Your caregivers are, are key in terms of how you're going to see life. Yeah. 
definitely I agree with everyone there's so much that you spoke about there like and I think that's the thing that I really recognised about going back to Ghana is like going back to nature and how they've, they've not disconnected the way we have and as you say that then leads into the disconnection with humans and your child and it's de definitely as you say when I went to Ghana my mum and dad had split up at a young age and I didn't have that connection with my dad's side of the family and so when I went to Ghana for the first time and all the family members were there and cousins were in contact with cousins four or five times down the line and it was just all this family and it was very much family orientated from the elders being really respected to yeah the young ones having going to this auntie and this auntie um, and that's one of the things that you do see my background prior to going into yoga was in social work and that would be totally frowned upon if you had about six or seven different people in the house looking after this one child that is the onus is put on the mum to do all the work and yeah it was just so beautiful to see that you do need the mum needs to be able to have a break because she's not going to be on top form for her child all the time so having all these other people around really I think can benefit the child obviously they've got to be the right people but yeah having that family connection they grow up with that sense of safety knowing that it doesn't need to be their mum they need to latch on to they've got all these other people here learning them about life um so there is that element and aspect of it I think that I've really um got from me in a way is just connecting back to nature from that point of view and just in other ways as well eating off the land but what you're saying there about women as well feeling more empowered with periods I do believe one of my teachers had said do you really think whether you're religious or not but do you really think God put women on this earth to suffer every month not at all and um, so it's coming back <laughs> to um, the days when women were revered for their like yeah just being women and the power that we hold, particularly from menstruating, a lot of the work that I've done, I was looking at the power that we hold, that even if we're not birthing life into the world, we can birth creation from our womb space. And it's seeing our womb as this sacred place rather than, I know there's a lot of trauma that happens for us as women, whether it be personal or there could be abuse, these sort of things where we totally disconnect from our womb. And I do believe that energetic space as well from our womb and our heart, if that's disconnected, then we're not fully in our power. So I think, yeah, telling, not telling, educating young women, young girls, 10, that's when I first took my period and it was like the worst thing ever. My mum hardly spoke to me about it, but just educating, yeah, to see that this is the cycles that we go through and these are the emotions and this is, as you say, what you can be doing perhaps in the new moon cycle. This is how you might be able to then be starting to create things. And yeah, just really being in touch with, our own bodies and not seeing them as this negative part of ourselves that a lot of the time I know for me it was like more about the man being able to have control of that for me from a sexual point of thing but even now seeing the power of women online that are owning their sexuality and saying this is me and I'm naked for me perhaps or I'm in this sexy underwear if you like but it's for me it's not for anyone else it makes me feel powerful within myself so yeah, just seeing, I think, sex as well is not this negative thing that is only really a man that dictates it and women can't enjoy it and all the negative words that go around with it as well, like slut, cow, and just own. You see now women are taking back those words and, yeah, bring them back into their own power. So I think this generation, my generation, your generation has done a lot of the healing work so that our younger generation now don't need to go through the same thing. So it's really bringing that awareness to them being able to own their body and own themselves. Absolutely. And, you know, much as we, you know, we have to take responsibility for how we've allowed ourselves to be treated, maybe with the fear of, you know, being left, the fear of being whatever you know, whatever it was that we were, we were scared of, now we're like that, well, we actually don't need to be scared anymore because we are completely interdependent. We're educated, we can, you know, generate our own money, we can even buy sperm off the internet if we actually wanted to, you know, which is, so in a way, mm. we can now come from a kind of equal place. And, um, you know, when I went to uh, Kisoro, the my friend introduced me as his mother. And I realised that that's actually one of the greatest honours that somebody can say about you because this is somebody that's played this role in my life that's been really important to me it didn't I'm not his biological mother but he saw me as that protective nurturing human and I thought my god 
you know, it's actually revered, which of course it should be. And it's, it's just not like that in a lot of places in the West. And certainly a lot of men, they leave the mother of their children and there's all sorts of reasons for that. But, you know, instead of being, wow, look what we've created and let's, you know, um, bring this child up and even and the conscious kind of decoupling if that has to happen, which I think sometimes it has to, you know, as we as we evolve and move on and things change. But I think really we have to be looking at the, you know, how we do that to minimise, <clears throat> you know, abandonment issues etc and all the stuff that we know that happens when a child makes up the stories in their own mind because they've not been given the honest information you know mm -hmm. so listen I could be chatting on to you for <laughs> all day <laughs> yeah I know I really hope I that you been so be at the farm soon because obviously you had to postpone your retreat but um, hopefully in the new year somewhere you'll uh, you'll all be coming um, and I get to hang out and um, learn even more from you. So I'll put your contact details, um, obviously, in the podcast um, so that people can contact you because I know that all these hormonal issues and gut issues and nutrition issues are literally, they're a pandemic right now. So um, if, what, what would be the process be? Would somebody just ping you an email or... Do you do any consultations or how, what's the process if people want to work with you and get some good, solid guidance? A um, few options at the moment. So I'm back in Scotland for the foreseeable future. Um, so in person, I can see people in person or online, which if you go into my website, which I can give you the details for, there's a Discover You call to see which way um, I can possibly support someone. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to be running a five-week course called she is the future which is basically self holistic empowered living is the future so it's for women and it'll be just a small snippet um coming on from the information and the stuff that i shared on the september challenge but just in a bit more intimate um setting so we'll come together over the five weeks and it'll depend on the group what they're kind of coming with as to what the main topics will be but it can be anything from looking at infertility hormone hormone imbalance in general or perimenopause symptoms or reproductive health conditions and then I'll just be sharing different yoga breath work and meditation practices specifically for them giving them some advice on nutrition including supplements uh, that we can be taking and and yeah, just a bit about belief coding. So again, that looking at our self beliefs before we make any changes, what do we need to look at to change with our belief system? So I'll be bringing in elements of that and lots of other stuff, but I've got it on the website as well. So if people were interested in joining that, I know coaching, particularly in this financial environment at the moment, is not feasible for everyone. So this just makes us a little bit more attainable to be able to come along and get some advice personally in a group setting. Yeah, I, li I love group work actually. Because I think the end up the group supports the group as well. And mm -hmm, what we find mm -hmm. from a lot of our retreats is people make these lifelong friends. Um, and, you know, I'm in all these group chats, but all the people that have come and hung out and learned and been inspired because that's, you know, a lot of the time it's just been reminded gently to do things. You know, there's not, there's, yeah. there's not, it's not rocket science really, is it? You know, you're just saying reconnect to nature. That's it. And our food, light, water everything that you know and our cycles um so we can all do going that. back to our ancestors basically and how they lived in a lot of ways and bringing a lot and that's what we're seeing with a lot of the natural um, medicines and things it's stuff that you knew your granny told you and things like that so absolutely and it's growing you know when i met claire who i co-wrote the scotland's mild medicine with um i was like oh my god i've been walking past all these medicines stamping over the top of them had no idea so that's something that you know i'm really passionate about getting that message out that nature provides everything that we need <laughs> i was fascinated because i came to that so i met you was one of the cold water swims and you were talking about stuff that was on the grass there and how good it was for our immune system coming into the winter so okay. yeah i've got your book but i was away in ghana so i never managed to really get a good read of it so i'm looking forward to yeah, getting to see what I can stock up in for the winter. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Well, listen, it's lovely to see you and lovely to chat and well done on all your achievements. And um, I look forward to seeing you really soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. That's all. Huge love. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Bye.